I'll take a look at the Specialist Mathematics Paper 1 Tech Free for the QCAA Syllabus 2024 Multiple Choice Exam. Um, in pretty much this exam, you get access to certain graphics calculators. You also get access to this particular formula sheet. Um, pretty much, I'll just be going through how to answer each question. If you have any questions at all in the video, try and leave something in the comments and timestamp when your question is. Uh, but otherwise, let's get straight into it, okay? Um, but this one is non-calc, so you, the only thing you have pretty much is your knowledge of the syllabus and pretty much the formula sheet, okay? So, repeated random samples will be used to calculate a large number of a 90% confidence interval for an approximate mean mu, okay? Which statement best describes the possible answers? So, what this means is 90, approximately 90% 90 of it will be within that little interval, okay? So when they say best describe the possible outcomes, well, the middle two are incorrect because they're saying more than 90% or less than 90%. We don't know that for certain pretty much. It's gonna be approximately around 90%. And the reason why D is also incorrect is because they're saying exactly 90%, okay? So the best possible answer would actually be A because they're saying approximately 90% of the intervals will contain mu, which is the average, okay? All right, so that one's just something you just have to know basically and just picking out the best statement there, okay? Alrighty, question two. Given that a over x minus two plus three over x equals x minus six over x times x minus two, determine the value of a. So this is a partial fractions question. So with this one here, what we do is you have to rearrange this. Now you can't just substitute um, certain values straight away because you'll get some divide by zero. So when you do partial fractions, you times everything by this side, that will directly cancel out this guy here, leaving an x next to that guy, and cancel out, out that guy, leaving the x minus 2 there. So what we can do is rewrite this statement by pretty much multiplying both sides by this here in the yellow. So you'll have a times by x plus 3 times by x minus 2, because each of those respective terms would cancel out because you've got them there. And then here you'll just have x minus 6. Now what we want to do is pretty much cancel out the x, okay? because we can't solve for two variables with one equation. So here we can see if we let um, if we let x equal 2, this term disappears straight away. Okay, And then also all the other terms would disappear. Um, now technically you could sub in any x value if you want to, but I'm just going to choose x equals 2 because sometimes they might have another unknown here on a different test. So if we go x equals 2, we'll have 2 times by a plus effectively 0. And then here you have 2 minus 6. So 2a equals negative 4. Therefore, if you divide both sides by 2, a is going to be negative 2. So your correct answer here is b, negative 2. Okay? Alright, let's take a look at the next one. Alright. Consider the proof of the proposition um, using mathematical induction. Within the proof of the inductive step, the proposition for n equals k plus 1 can be expressed as. Okay. So what we've got to understand here is some notation. So... The thing that would change when we put in some notation would be this, not the j, because the j is standing for each of these values we're plugging in, okay? Because if we plug in k plus 1 for the j straight away, well, we don't have a sum anymore with j in it. So these questions here, if you'll notice, because they have j and k, there is no j left, so this actually doesn't mean anything. Same with these ones. So they're actually incorrect statements. So you don't put the k plus 1 where the j is. That is a placeholder for the sum notation. You place it up there where the n is, okay? So just up that one there, okay? So here you'll notice these two examples just have the k plus 1 up there for the sum notation. However, these two here are slightly different. So what we got to do now is put the um, n equals k plus 1, so this term, directly in there. So technically we're squaring that, so k plus 1 squared. Now what they've done there is they've written the incorrect answer. They have done that, k squared plus 1 squared, which is 1. You don't actually do that. When you're doing k plus 1 squared, what that means is k plus 1 times by k plus 1. So if you were to expand that properly, you'd go k times k, k times k, I'm uh, sorry, k times k, k times k, k times 1, uh, 1 times k, and 1 times 1. So when you expand that out, you'll get a k squared, 2 lots of k, plus 1. So the correct answer here is actually a, okay? So that's where you've got to know your inductive step, and also how some notations work, pretty much, okay? 
All right, let's take a look at question four now. So, question four. A plane contain, contains the point 1, 3, 1, and the normal to and normal to the vector 1, uh, so i plus j plus 2k. The vector equation of the plane is, okay, so on your formula sheet, you'll have access to this formula here for the equation of a plane, okay? Now, r is a generic vector or a generic place on the plane, which is just x, y, and z. The n is your normal vector, okay? So what we've got to look for is pretty much this guy, the x, y, and z, dotted with the normal vector, which is 1, 1, 2. Now, you'll look down here and they'll have a time symbol here. Now, times is another way we can say dot product, but that actually means cross product. So these bottom two are incorrect straight away. Now, what we want to look for is the one that has the um, normal vector present next to the x, y, and z. Now, this one has that point there. So that one's incorrect. So the correct answer here has to be B because it has 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2 dotted with X, Y, Z. And another way you can double check it as well is you'll have A, which is a generic point, which is our point here, which is 1, 3, 1, dotted with your normal vector, which is the 1, 1, 2, which is what they also have here. So that is 100% the correct answer. Okay. All right. If you have any questions about this one, leave something in the comments. Likewise with any of the other questions we've gone through, okay? All right, question five. The augmented matrix shown is produced when a Gaussian elimination technique is used to solve a certain system of equations with three variables. Given that row one's values of the matrix represent x plus 4y plus 2z equals negative 10, the unique solution for y is. Okay, so this is x, y, z, and your number, okay? So they got this equation here. Oh, what is the highlighter doing? I might just underline it. They got this equation here from that first row. I know it seems pretty obvious because they just said it there, but a lot of students will miss that, okay? Now they said the unique solution for y is. Well, we've got to look at the other rows here. Now, this row here would just give us the equation three. Oh, what's wrong with the pen? This would just give us three times z equals two. So that would give us a unique solution for z. But if you look at that middle row, you've got 2y equals 5. So you can just write that guy there as 2y equals 5. Now if you solve that, that will produce a unique solution for y because there's zeros in the other places where the other variables would have been. Okay. So here if you divide both sides by 2, you get y equals 5 over 2. So your correct answer is d. Okay. Alright, let's take a look at the next one. Alright, question 6. Players P, Q, and R, and S play each other once in a competition where there were no draws. Only the following results are known. So, P player P defeated players Q and R, player Q defeated two players, and players R and S defeated one player. Based on the results, a dominance matrix was constructed as shown below. Okay, now, we can work out all this information regardless of the dominance matrix. So what you do is just draw pretty much the players as little dot points, okay? So here, P, Q, R, S. Now, we're going to draw an arrow to whoever player defeats who. So here, player P defeats players Q and R. So we're going to draw an arrow facing to them. So those are the players that person has defeated, okay? Now, Q has defeated two players. Now, you're not versing a player more than once. And there's only two players he has in verse. That is R and S. So Q has also defeated R and S. Well, that's the information we've got in there. Players R and S defeat one player. Well, let's take a look here. So R has not verse S. And S has in verse P. So R has to defeat S. And the S has to defeat P. So we've got all the information here of who beat who, etc. Okay. Now in a dominance matrix, you put a one if you've defeated the person and we read it pretty much as like rows rather than columns. So for example, if we're reading that first row there, now if they're versing themselves, you have to put a zero. That's why it's P, P is zero. But P defeated Q. That's why we've put a one there. P also defeated R, that's why we put a 1 there. And P lost to S, which is why they have a 0 there. So even if we didn't get this dominance matrix, we can make it from this diagram here. Now here, all we've got to do is just fill out this information. So P 
when a um, Q, when they verse P, they loss. So there's a zero there. Q cannot verse itself, so it's a zero there. Q defeated R, so we put a one there. And Q also defeated S, so we put another one there as well. Now we just look for the matrix that matches up perfectly. So we're only looking at this row here with each of them, okay? So the one that has the correct row, you can probably see it, is B, okay? So B is the correct answer in this case here, okay? All right, let's take a look at the next one. All right, um, question seven. A, B, and C are points in a three-dimensional space. If two times by A to B is equal to B to C, then, and you've got a couple of values here. Well, here's the thing. So vectors indicate direction, right? But so do points. Points have distinct spots. So in order for this to be true, so we have the vector. That's the vector, let's say that's... um. A to B, all right? They're saying that is twice the vector B to C. Now, B has to stay in the same spot. So it has to look like this. So this is the diagram we get from this picture here, okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the length necessarily. Um, that is not true at all. They're not perpendicular. Only one plane contains those points. Uh, not necessarily. You can rearrange them in other ways. But um, this one is the distinct picture we get from it. A straight line passes through A, B, and C, which is what we got here. So D is the correct answer, okay, or the most correct. Okay, let's take a look at question 8. So given Z equals 2 CIS pi over 3, determine Z cubed. So this is pretty easy. All we have to do is cube this guy here. So 2 CIS pi over 3 getting all cubed. So here, CIS theta stands for cos theta plus plus... If it loads, I don't know what's wrong with the pen today. Plus I sine theta. Okay. Now what we're going to do is use De Moivre's theorem. So De Moivre's theorem means we pretty much put that power up there. And we multiply that power by the angle here. So if we're simplifying this expression, we've basically got Z cubed equals 2 to the power of 3. CAS 3 times by pi over 3. So what they'll simplify to is 8 CS pi. Now, if we chuck this information into here, we'll get 8 times by cos pi plus i sine pi. Now, sine of pi is 0, and cos of pi is negative 1. So we can replace that with negative 1. So basically, we have 8 times by negative 1, which just gives you negative 8, if... I don't know what's wrong with the pen today, but that's okay. So negative 8 is your correct answer for this one here, okay? Um, yeah, if you have any questions about this one, leave something in the comments as well. Okay, uh, question 9. Use a suitable double angle identity to determine the integral to sine squared. Okay, so whenever we're integrating sine squared, go to this spot on your formula sheet if you're not sure, okay? You'll want to look directly either in this section or in here. Most particularly, you want to look at this identity here, okay? So, we want to write pretty much that guy on this page here. So, what is it? The, oh, I've already forgotten it. It's cos 2a equals, and then what is it? 1 minus 2 sine squared a. Rearrange this to get the sine squared alone. So, if we re were to rearrange this, sine squared of a is equal to cos 2a minus 1 over minus 2. Now, if we're doing 2 sine squared of x, we can times this side by 2, cancelling out that 2 on the bottom. So we can just apply that negative to each of them without pretty much putting a divide by 2, because it would have got cancelled. So here we'll just have negative cos 2x, subtract now negative divided by negative is positive so positive one okay right so here we are just needing to integrate negative cos so basically actually i'll just change this color here so this integral to sine squared x dx is the same as integrating negative cos 2x plus 1 dx okay so if you integrate negative cos 2x, 
So negative cos will turn into negative sine, okay? So you look for the ones that have negative sine. So it's either C or A. But you also have to divide by the 2. So it's negative sine 2x divided by 2 because that's the derivative of the inside function. Integrating 1 turns into x and then a plus C. So here we can see clearly that C is the correct answer here, okay? Regardless of the order we've written it in, okay? All right, let's take a look at question 10, the last one. So, the polynomial uh, z of, oh, sorry, p of z equals z cubed minus 2i z squared plus z minus 2i can be expressed in a factorized form as seen there, okay? Where b is an unknown. So here, b, well, not b is an unknown, b is a integer, okay? Determine the value of b. So, if this is the factorized form, that means if I were to do long division with this linear factor on that, that would produce the quadratic expression as my overall result. So here, all we need to do is do not all the long division, but a little bit of the long division, okay? So if we were to do it like this, so we write like that. So here, what we start off with is pretty much, all right, let's go z cubed divided by z, okay? That gives us z squared. Then you multiply the z squared by this expression here. So if I go z squared times z, that's uh, z cubed. And if I go z squared times by negative i, that's negative i z squared. And if I subtract that, the way we know if we've done long division correct is you should cancel out that first term. So z cubed minus z cubed gives you zero. Now here, negative 2i z squared minus negative i z squared. So basically, it's like negative 2 plus i, okay? So that's going to give you, oh, sorry, negative 2 plus 1. So that's basically going to be negative 1. So in this case, it's negative i z squared, and then we move the rest down. Now, we don't have to do much more long division because we've already got the first term there. So when I divide the z by the next term, it'll give us this expression here with the integer involved. So here, if I go now, this term divided by z, that's just going to give you negative i z, okay? Now here, if negative i z is equal to b i z, that means b has to be negative 1. So the correct answer here is c, okay? All right. So that was the specialist multiple choice uh, 2024 exam explained. If you have any questions about this one here, oh, this is the tech-free one, leave something in the comments, but otherwise I'll see you in the next video.